A very useful tool we can use in Windows Server 2016 and also older versions of Windows is Distributed File System, or DFS. Let's take a look and see how we install and use DFS on Windows Server 2016. Let's go to Add Roles and Features. Click Next. Let's make sure that we have the correct server, which we do. Click Next. And we'll expand our file and storage services. From here, we'll check on both DFS namespaces, click Add Features, and DFS Replication. The namespace allows us to have a shared namespace amongst multiple servers, whereas DFS Replication allows us to replicate that data amongst multiple servers. And this will make a lot more sense after we install it and set up our first DFS share. Let's go ahead and click Next, Next, and Install. Now we need to do the same thing on the second server. So I'll go ahead and install that on DCO2 as well, and then we'll go ahead and get started with our configuration. DFS has now been installed, and before we open up the DFS Manager, let's go into our File Explorer, and we're going to go to the C drive and create and share a folder called Data. We'll right click on the folder, go to properties, and from here we'll click on sharing. Everyone full control for our demonstration, and domain users will also have full control. So if we go to backslash backslash dc01, hit enter, and we see our data folder. Now I've done the exact same thing on DCO2 as well. So let's go backslash backslash DCO2. And also there's our data folder. And there's nothing in that folder as of now. We'll go ahead and minimize our file explorer. And now we'll go to tools and then go to DFS management. Because we installed both of the different DFS roles, we see a DFS namespace and a DFS replication. Now you're going to see a default domain system volume, and that's because this is a domain controller, and domain controllers use DFS to replicate Active Directory back and forth between other domain controllers. So we have two domain controllers, DCO1 and DCO2. They both have DFS installed, but even if we didn't have DFS installed, they would still use DFS to replicate data. You just wouldn't see it like we do now. So we just want to leave that alone. Don't make any changes to it, otherwise you could break Active Directory replication. If you install this on a non-DC, then you won't notice this being here. Let's start with namespace. So what we want to do is in DFS, the reason for it, is so we can create a namespace that we can share amongst two or more servers. If for some reason one of the servers goes down, then the other server will continue to service the data folder, in this particular case, uh, using the same namespace. So let's go ahead and right click and choose new namespace. So we're going to choose our servers. Let's click to browse and type in DC01. Check names, click OK, click Next. Now we're going to enter a name for the namespace. So I like to just use DFS, and that's because we know what it is if we call it that. It just makes it easier. But you can call it anything you want, and again, this will make more sense after we're done. Go ahead and click uh, the Edit button, and I'm going to go ahead and give everybody full, full permissions just for this particular demonstration. And we already gave full permissions to the folder, but now we're also doing it through DFS itself. Go ahead and click Next. And so our namespace is going to be widget llc.internal backslash DFS. You can also create a standalone namespace if you're on a non-domain computer. Click Create and Close. So let's go back to File Explorer. Let's open up a new File Explorer. And we're going to go to backslash backslash widget llc backslash dfs and hit enter and we see a nice blank page which is great if we hit the up arrow and we don't get anything so let's go ahead and cancel that now we're going to make it so you see an actual shared folder so let's go ahead and minimize that for a second and again i already created a folder on both servers and shared it called data let's right click and choose new folder 
Now we're not creating a new folder, we're just connecting to the new folder. We're going to give the folder name the same name that we gave it in File Explorer, but you don't have to. And we're going to call it Data. Now we need to add some server folder targets. So these are the names of our two servers. Let's go ahead and click Add, click Browse, and we can see that our server name is DCO1 by default. Let's go ahead and choose the Data folder and click OK. OK again. Now we'll click Add one more time, click Browse, and this time we're going to browse to a different server. It's going to be DCO2. Check names, click OK, and we see the data folder. Perfect. Let's go ahead and click OK. Keep it the same. OK. So now we see DCO1 data and DCO2 data. But they're both going to respond to this namespace when we type it in File Explorer. Let's go ahead and click OK. Now, as soon as we do that, we get a message that says, hey, would you also like to synchronize the folder targets? Now, you don't have to do this, but here's the advantage of synchronization. So if you add data to one server, it will automatically replicate the data to the other server. And that's going to be the case for most companies that they are going to want to do this. So we're going to go ahead and allow that. If you don't, then what will happen is if somebody adds data to DCO1, data folder, it won't show up also in DCO2, and so that sort of removes the redundancy, and which is the whole reason for doing this. I've used this many times where I've had a client with two locations and two servers, and they have a slow connection between the two locations. So they may have DCO1 in, in one location, and they'll have DCO2 in another location. So the way DFS works is they're going to use the same widget LLC.internal backslash DFS backslash data uh, mapped drive in both locations. However, in the remote office, it will connect to the remote server, which is local to them. In the main office, Office, they'll connect to the main server which is local to them so that way they always get the fastest connection let's go ahead and choose the defaults and click next make sure both servers are in the list click next choose a primary member it just has to have somebody in charge although that can change if it looks like DCO one is not ever going to come back up again after an outage now you have the option for a full mesh or no topology. Full mesh is exactly what we want because that will replicate between all these different locations. If you had a third uh, server in this, then you would have the hub and spoke option and it describes what that is. We're going to use the full bandwidth, but you don't have to. So if you have a slow connection between the offices, you can choose replication where you can have full bandwidth after certain amounts of time and little to no bandwidth during the daytime hours where you may want to keep that link up at its fastest connect. Let's go ahead and choose the replicate continuously and choose next and choose create. No errors, fantastic. And it says here, replication will not begin until the configuration is picked up by the members. So what this means is it's not going to replicate right away. It's going to take five or ten minutes before the replication begins. And the more data that you have in one side or the other will cause the replication to take longer until it completes. We'll click OK. And now we see replication using our same name as the namespace. So now if we go back to our folder with DFS, we see that data has now popped up because we added the data folder to our namespace. So if I double click on that, we can see there's our namespace just as we created it, widget LLC, DFS, and then data. You may not see the dot internal, but you would certainly work with that if you typed it in as well. So let's go ahead and put a folder into one of our two locations. Let's open up a third file explorer. And we're going to go to DCO1. And we'll go to data. And we'll create a new folder, or a new file, I should say. And we'll just call it test. So if we go to DCO2 and we go to data, we don't see test. And that's because the replication hasn't happened yet. Once DFS replication happens, then you're going to uh, see the data in both locations. However, the users aren't going to connect to DCO1 or DCO2 by name. They're going to connect to the shared name, which is going to be the widget LLC that we see, that we see here. All right. So now if we go to the widget LLC DFS data, we actually see that test file. So what that tells us is 
that right now it's saying DC01 is the faster of the two servers. So we can see the test file in DC01, however, there is no file in DC02. If the folder was blank, then I would say DC02 was the responding server because it currently has no data. But however, in a couple of minutes, we're going to refresh the screen and we're going to see the data replicate over to DC02, and so it'll be in both places. And there it is. We now see, after a couple of minutes have passed, went ahead and fast forwarded, we see the test file is in both locations. It has replicated to both places. There's also command line tools you can look up that can test to see whether replication is working properly or to force a replication without having to wait. So as an IT administrator, you're going to want to map the drive not to DC1 or DC02, but to widget LLC DFS. So let's go back to where it says this PC and we'll go to computer map network drive. So now we're going to type in widget LLC backslash DFS backslash data. Click finish and now it's our Z drive. So if we go back to this PC, we see it as our Z drive. So what's great about this is, let's say DC02 goes offline. That's okay. DC01 will continue to service all the clients using this shared name that both servers would respond to. And then server one, DC01 will continue to service those clients. If DC02 comes back up again, then whoever connects to that uh, to the closer office will start using DC02 once again. So that's how you configure Distributed File System, or DFS, in Windows Server 2016.